What are the promising use cases for reconfigurable intelligent surfaces in 6G? This is what I will try to shed light on in this presentation. I'm Emil Björnsson from the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. So when it comes to 6G, people have had a number of different opinions in the past about what frequency bands that would be used. Because we know that 2G to 4G were operating in certain bands, 5G had two different designated bands, but most of the deployment has been in the lower mid-band around 3.5 gigahertz. And now we know roughly which bands that will be considered in 60. We have the International Telecommunications Union, IDU, that harmonized the worldwide spectrum usage. IDU had a meeting last year where they looked into which new frequency bands could be assigned for 6G. And all of those ones are around the new mid-band, particularly the upper mid-band between 7 to 24 gigahertz. So they are somewhat in between the two different 5G bands. They had one band around 4.6 gigahertz, one around 7.8, and one around 15 gigahertz that were considered. And among these ones is only the one at around 7.8 gigahertz that contains a huge amount of new spectrum as compared to what we already have in 5G networks. So I will consider this as the main band in this presentation. So is there a role for RAS in this new band? A reconfigurable intelligent surface is a surface containing many reflecting elements that can phase shift the signal. And one particular use case in general is that the signal from a user device can be reflected by this surface in a controllable manner towards the base station. And one thing to keep in mind here is that this is a frequency flat operation that this surface is doing. So the same phase shift will be assigned in the entire band that the RAS is used in. However, the 6G bands, they are pretty wide. For that reason, I hypothesized that RAS might only be useful when the channel have very small variations over the frequency domain, namely having line of sight channels from the user to the surface and from the surface to the base station. Let us have a look at some potential use cases. One is to support fixed wireless, where we have a base station that is supposed to provide coverage to particular locations. And this uh, is a case where we can deploy the RAS, so we have line of sight to the base station, and we can make sure that we have line of sight also to the location where the potential uses are, because they are at fixed locations. And I will show you some simulation results with realistic channels where we have 2000 RAS elements and we have the RAS somewhere in the middle between the base station and the user locations. And this is for the 7.8 GHz band, where I'm showing you the capacity that we can achieve for different signal to noise ratios. The black line here is what we would get with only a non line of sight path between the base station and the locations where the user are. So this is what we would achieve without a RAS. There are four other curves here for different combinations of line of sight or non-line of sight. Most of them are rather close to the case where we don't have any RAS at all. It is only in the case where we have line of sight both to and from the RAS that we have a substantial improvement. Which means that yes, RAS is beneficial only when we have line of sight and we were are creating a virtual line of sight path between the base station and RAS to the user. The second use case is to try to enhance the capacity of an entire cell. So we have a base station, we deploy the RAS at the fixed location with line of sight, and then we let the users be at different locations here. And then there will be a probability of having line of sight between the user and RAS. And the further away you are, the lower will be the probability. So here is the spectral efficiency in bits per second hertz and the cumulative distribution function that shows you the random variation we will have in the spectral efficiency depending on where the user is. The curve in the middle is for the case when we only have a static path between the base station and the user. So there is no RAS in the system. And if we deploy an RAS, we naturally get a better performance. It is the shift to the right here. And it's also important to notice that if we take away the static path, which you can see in many technical papers that they are ignoring it, well, we are losing of the performance. So the point here is that we still need the static path. We cannot only rely on the RAS, but we can get some improvements 
They are not very large, but they are consistent throughout the cell. The third use case is to provide capacity improvements in a particular region of interest. So there are some location where we have importance of being able to deliver performance to the users. And the base station cannot do that on its own. So we make sure that we deploy an RS that sees all the potential locations. We always have line of sight everywhere in this region, which we didn't have in the previous use case. So in this case, we can once again look at the spectral efficiency with a statistical metric here, the cumulative distribution function. And now we have once again the black curve without an RS, and we can see a much more substantial improvement when we deploy the RS. So this is because we have deployed it to always have line of sight, so it's always useful for all the users. But also in this case, when we always have line of sight to the user, we still need to have the combination of a static and a RAS path. So the case with only the RAS path is performing much worse. The fourth use case is to deliver reliable services to users even at the cell edge. So suppose we have a base station at the location and we have users all around at the cell edge and we deploy an RAS in order to improve the performance there. And we want to deliver services with a particular quality. So suppose in this case that we have a reconfigurable intelligent surface deployed to deliver three bits per second hertz to all the users. What is the coverage probability for that? Well, that is what we show here for different transmit powers at the base station. And what you can see is that if we only have ARIAs, we get the values here to the right, which means that we need a lot of power to even provide the service to some of the users. If we only have the static path, we get the black curve here. And if we add ARIAs, we get the curve here, the solid one. So we once again, we get an improvement for every given transmit power value. We have a higher probability in order to deliver the services that we want. And in this case, we both see that we provide more power to the user and we get a kind of channel hardening effect where the RAS path becomes more reliable because it contains a lot of RAS elements that can improve the performance along the way. So those were the four main use cases for the RAS technology in the upper midband, in our opinion. And what you could see is that there is a clear but kind of modest gain of adding an RAS in these scenarios. Maybe the largest gain were when we are deploying an RAS in order to improve the coverage into one particular region of interest. If you want to get all the details, you should check out our paper, Reconfigurable Intelligent Surfaces in Upper Midband 60 Networks, Gain or Pain. You can find it on Archive and you have a link in the description. Thank you very much for watching.